logging in for the, the Breathing Easier series. Um, we're going to start in just a minute or two. We're waiting for a few more attendees. So just hang tight and we'll start real soon. Thank you. Okay, we're going to we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, first I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for the Breathing Easier for Breathing Easier. It's the first in Lung Cancer Alliance's coping webinar series, and it's designed to educate and provide practical ways to manage the most common symptoms and side effects experienced by lung cancer patients and survivors. I'm Maureen Rigney. I'm going to be your moderator today. I'm a social worker and I'm director of support initiatives at Lung Cancer Alliance. We're a national nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., and dedicated to improving care and quality of life for the lung cancer community. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Um, if you'd like more information on Lung Cancer Alliance, our programs and initiatives, you can visit our uh, website or you can just email me directly there at mrigney at lungcanceralliance.org. In a recent Lung Cancer Alliance survey of over 800 lung cancer patients, survivors, and loved ones, we learned the most problematic symptom or side effect is shortness of breath, also called dyspnea. Through this webinar, three experts will help you learn about and manage breathlessness. To complement today's presentations, we have a tip sheet with many of the ideas we'll discuss today for coping with shortness of breath, along with basic breathing and movement exercises to get you started. To request a copy, email support at lungcanceralliance.org or call our toll-free helpline at 1-800-298-2436. You can download copies of the tip sheet at our website, where we'll also host a blog with the contents of this webinar tomorrow. And please visit our Facebook page to learn more about one of our presenters, survivor Beverly Goldsmith. We plan to have about 10 minutes or so at the end uh, for your questions, but please feel free to ask them in the question section of your screen as they come to you. It's now my great honor to introduce our three experts. Beverly Goldsmith retired after practicing psychiatric nursing for 37 years and has served as a professional volunteer with Hadassah Women's Zionist Organization of America in New York for 14 years. There she works to educate the public about the nursing profession and to reduce the severe nursing shortage in the U.S. She was first diagnosed with lung cancer in 2008 and has lived with one lung for nearly seven years. Nurse practitioner Dr. Lynn Reinke has a special focus on lung cancer and COPD. She's the author of over 30 articles and is recognized nationally and internationally as an expert in dyspnea crisis management. Dr. Reinke's health policy interests include improving early access to community palliative care services and the provision of value-based care for seriously ill older adults. Through her work as a personal trainer at the Integrative Medicine Center at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, and her host of breathing videos on YouTube, Donna Wilson helps cancer patients and survivors to restore flexibility, rebuild strength, and decrease fatigue and breathlessness. In 2009, she organized the Empire Dragon, the first woman cancer survivor dragon boat team, which raises funds for cancer research and survivorship programs. Here's our agenda for today. First, we'll introduce you to the topic of shortness of breath and what it means for lung cancer patients and survivor, survivors. 
<clears throat> you'll hear from Beverly about her lung cancer experiences and how she's learned to cope with shortness of breath. Dr. Renke will review medical and non-medical interventions, some of which may surprise you in their simplicity. And Donna will help us learn how to breathe most effectively and understand the importance of staying active. So what do we mean by shortness of breath? You may experience shortness of breath as a tightness in the chest or the feeling that you can't get enough air, sometimes called air hunger. Of course, everyone gets winded and has temporary shortness of breath on exertion or while exercising, but for many lung cancer survivors, difficulty breathing is a regular occurrence that interferes with their ability to do the things they'd like to do. First, we'll hear from Beverly about her lung cancer journey and the challenges she faced after the loss of her lung. As Maureen said, I am Beverly Goldsmith. I'm a nurse, now retired, but I am also a mother and a wife. I am a woman who has dealt with the illnesses and deaths of two sons as well as someone who has survived treatment for lung cancer and the loss of my lung. Needless to say, I have had my share of adversity, and like so many of us, I have learned to live with it and go on. At this time in my life, I can honestly say that I am living the life of a normal 69-year-old married woman, doing what I want, largely because of the treatment care and follow-up I have received for lung cancer. I learned how to adjust, compensate, strengthen, and adapt during the treatment and recovery phases of my disease. I was first diagnosed with lung cancer nine years ago in March 2008. I had experienced chest pain while running. And while the doctors thought it was gastrointestinal, I had a full workup. At the end of the exam, the doctor ordered a chest x-ray. My cancer was found, and so began my journey. The first diagnosis was stage one. I had surgery to remove the lower lobe of my right lung, which was a shock to my system, but not a difficult recovery. I was back to normal within a few months. In hindsight, losing one lobe is not too bad. Two years later, I again was diagnosed with stage one lung cancer, found early as a result of my every three month follow-up. It was a very small recurrence or new cancer detected in a different area of the right lung. I had a second surgery. This time the surgery was at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. I prepared for the surgery and did the breathing exercises and using my training as a psychiatric nurse, I asked all the questions I could think of so I would not overly worry. The surgeon told me he would try to save the lung but if he couldn't, it would be better to just remove it for the quality of my life. I was also told before surgery that people can live a normal life having just one lung and that I would not need oxygen for daily living. There was t I was told that I would have enough lung capacity for activities of daily living. During the first few days of recovery, I focused my attention on coping and getting better and allowing myself time to heal and use medications as needed. The cancer was caught early enough that I didn't need chemotherapy. I recovered as I hoped I would. I didn't have any trouble breathing right after either of my surgeries. My good lung just took over. I was able to walk, go up and down the steps in the hospital, and any pain I had was controlled with medication. The difficult part for me began after discharge. I lived in Washington, D.C. at the time, and the ride home from New York City 
in a hundred degree heat was a difficult one. I remember being hot, uncomfortable, and worried. Who wouldn't be? I struggled most during the six months to a year following my second surgery, getting back to my normal life activities, walking, running, exercising, going places, doing work around the house, and of course shopping. Even talking on the phone was a challenge. I am proof that it is possible to cope, to live a normal life after being diagnosed with lung cancer, even after losing a lung. The presentations today will help you understand how you could still have control over your body and breathing and be able to live life as you choose. Thanks so much, Beverly, for sharing your story. Later, we'll hear from Beverly on the tips she's learned to manage breathlessness so she can continue to live her full and active life. Beverly's experiences may resonate with you. Trouble breathing is very common in lung cancer. Studies have found that as many as 90% of people living with lung cancer struggle with breathlessness at some point. Shortness of breath can be a short-term problem, but for many, it continues long after treatment ends. In our Lung Cancer Alliance survey, lung cancer survivors of five or more years still rated it as their most problematic issue. Health may interfere with how the lungs work, and they may not work properly. Treatments, of course, like radiation, certain medications, and surgery to remove all or part of a lung can result in breathing problems. Also, those diagnosed with lung cancer are likely to have other lung and heart diseases that also cause shortness of breath. For example, up to 70% of people with lung cancer also have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. And finally, being diagnosed, going through treatment, worrying about recurrence, and everything else the lung cancer experience may entail can cause anxiety, which can also make it difficult to breathe at times. For all the challenges that breathlessness can bring, there are solutions, many of which you can start using today. So we're going to turn it over to Dr. Ranke, and she'll start by reviewing potential uh, medical and non-medical interventions that may work for you. Thank you so much. Um, don't see my slides up, unfortunately, right now. OK, Lynn, um, they're on our screen. Um, Let me try again. The other two. Oh, OK, they're up now. Thank you. Sorry for that interruption. Okay. No, no problem. All right. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to spend the next, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes going over some of the medication and, and pharmacological and non-pharmacological approaches to help people manage their shortness of breath. As in the title, it's very important, as all of you know, is that we really need to focus on treating both the lung cancer and the symptoms that um, can um, occur with it. And today we're focusing, of course, on shortness of breath. So I'm going to start off with medications, and I'm going to preface this beginning by, by stating that it's really important for everyone to discuss different medication options with your provider. Everyone's different, and um, as Maureen had suggested, many people may have different underlying diseases, so all these medications may not be appropriate for everyone, or they may be. So um, again, it's important to sort of individualize and personalize your care. But I'm going to give an overview. One of the really helpful medications to help people with um, shortness of breath is what we call bronchodilators. They're inha inhalers that are very fast acting. An example is albuterol. These medications inhaled into the lungs can begin to open up and relax the airways within 30 seconds to a minute. So it's often helpful to take prior to exertion or your exercise or any other activity that might cause you to have shortness of breath. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened there. Okay, that's okay. 
I think I can go on without. Okay. Oh, there, there you there go. We go. Okay. There. All right. All right. And then there's then there's medications called long acting bronchodilators. These are medications that last about 12 hours. So you take them twice a day, and they keep the airways more steadily open. There's a variety of combinations of inhalers. Some have inhaled steroids in them to help keep the swelling down in the lungs, in addition to an, an uh, air relaxer or bronchodilator. But regardless of what type of inhaler your physician or provider may prescribe for you, it's really critical to learn the proper technique. Without learning it, often the medication doesn't get into the lungs properly, and then it won't work. And nebulizers is another delivery device that's used to help people when they're acutely short of breath. This is a small little handheld device that you can use in your home that helps to vaporize or um, take the liquid medicine into a mist that's much easier to inhale, especially if you're acutely short of breath and you can't get a deep breath in. So this is an illustration of all the many types of inhalers are out there. You can see that there's so many different types. And besides the types of different medicines that are in each inhaler, many of them have a different delivery device. I would really love to see the pharmaceutical companies come together and, and come up with one best delivery device, but that's unlikely that's not going to happen. So my take home hint is if you're prescribed it, sit with your nurse, sit with your physician, or see a pharmacist to help you to learn the proper technique of the various devices. This is an example or illustration of a, a very common meter dose inhaler. And again, the canister that you can see at the top has the medication in it. Um, and the blue device is actually just the delivery device and then the mouthpiece. The important part is that breathe in slowly um, while you're depressing the canister, and then keep deep breathing in deeply, and actually being able to hold your breath, if possible, for about you know six seconds to ten seconds, so the medication is deposited into the lungs. Then to wait about thirty seconds to a minute in between puffs. That way, the first puff and the medication goes down into the lungs, starts to relax the lungs and airways, and then the second puff of the medicine can go even deeper and be more effective for you. Some other medications that can be very helpful in terms of shortness of breath are some what we call opioids or morphine. Often when I suggest this for patients that have, um, this is for patients maybe with more chronic or long-term shortness of breath, my patients get a little concerned. They'll say, don't you know there's an opioid epidemic going on, Lynn? These, I like to reassure people that when we prescribe um, opioids for shortness of breath, we prescribe them in very, very low doses. I'll give you an example. Usually if we start out with someone in pain, we may start at 30 milligrams a day and go up from there. We use very small doses starting even sometimes at 5 to 10 milligrams. And then we'll titrate the dose according to the person's, how they're reacting to it or possible side effects. So there are some side effects to it, including constipation and drowsiness. And so we, we need to address those um, and prescribe appropriate um, bowel regimens. But these medications have been shown in many research um, studies to be very effective. Um, so it's worth considering if you're, if you're um, suffering from chronic shortness of breath. Um, as Maureen had mentioned, anxiety is a very natural component and a symptom that goes along with shortness of breath. It's really scary when someone's short of breath. The first thing you do is you hold your breath when you become short of breath, and you tense up the muscles in your body. So anti-anxiety medicines can really help to relax the body and help to, to manage anxiety and then indirectly help to decrease and manage shortness of breath. A lot of my patients will say to me, can I have some oxygen to help with shortness of breath? This may or may not be indicated, again, for you. Oxygen really is only helpful if the blood levels of oxygen in your body are low. And what I mean by this is if you put a pulse oximeter, a little device that many of you may be familiar with, on your finger and it's below, consistently below 90, 
then the oxygen is necessary to help your um, blood cells deliver adequate oxygen to all the vital organs and tissues in your body, your heart, your lungs, your brain. But if your, your oxygen levels remain in a normal level above 90, then oxygen is really not indicated and uh, usually does not help with, um, to relieve shortness of breath. I'm also now going to go over some non-medication approaches to, um, short, uh, to manage your shortness of breath. And I like to think about these as tools for your toolkit. Not maybe one of these is going to be the perfect solution when you have shortness of breath, and not all of them will be either. I think it's really very personalized in figuring out what techniques work well for you, what you can incorporate into your lifestyle, and what you can practice so that when you have an episode of shortness of breath, you kind of know, you're, you go naturally to some of these techniques that can help alleviate um, your, your breathing. Um, so I'm going to start with a very simple technique that I teach every single patient I see. And this is called pursed lip breathing. It's a naturally adopted. I see many people walking into my clinic with it, doing it. But sometimes they need, you need some reinforcement on actually how to do it properly and why it works. It's a simple um, inhalation through the nose. This illustration says one to two counts. I really like to even suggest longer, inhaling for two to four seconds, then following by a slow exhale. This can be used at rest or when you're moving around. I really encourage it when people are walking upstairs or doing an activity. How, what it works is it temporarily increases the oxygen levels in your bloodstream. So if you put a pulse oximeter on a finger, someone's finger, and I have them sit and practice this breathing technique, you'll automatically see the oxygen level increasing. It helps to prevent that airway collapse. So this is a simple technique that I believe everyone should, should learn and practice. Diaphragmatic breathing is another technique, and Donna is going to go through this in much greater detail. But this is um, very important to strengthen the diaphragm and can be very helpful um, to help to manage shortness of breath. And Donna is going to de describe this to you, but the diaphragm is a very major muscle, a large muscle that helps to support the lungs. So it's really important to use this muscle effectively to help to manage shortness of breath. This is so simple, um, but I really think that these are important, again, techniques to show. And these are simple position changes. So when someone's short of breath, say you are walking or you're moving around your house, just simply leaning over slightly will ex allow the lungs to expand just a little bit and have a little bit more room for that diaphragm to move in and out, that big muscle. So you can see that someone's leaning over the back of a chair or maybe sitting in the chair and putting their, you know, leaning over on their elbows, or even lying down and putting their head on some pillows. Say if you're out in a grocery store, I always suggest that my patients use a buggy, and just leaning over the shopping cart can help, again, put you in this exact same position. Or even simply standing up against the wall and leaning forward a little bit will help to give the lungs a little bit more room to inhale and exhale. It's important not to bend over too far because then sometimes you can cut off the diaphragm. But just these slight position changes can be helpful to relax your um, shoulders and upper chest. I'm going to review something that is near and dear to my heart. So many nurses have always said that we wanted to do study why our patients come to us and tell us that a handheld fan helps them breathe easier. So this study was actually done, conducted in England a few years ago, and it's incredibly effective and uh, beneficial. This group studied um, took these small little handheld fans, and they put um, a, took a group of patients and they put the fan to their face and nose for about five minutes, and then they then they put it to the arm to the leg, and they blinded the patient, and they had them rate their shortness of breath on a scale, and there was a 
a bit fairly big reduction in this in their level and patient's perception of their shortness of breath. Now, why does this work? Um, we believe that it's stimulate putting this um, fan close to the face, about six inches away, can help to stimulate the facial nerves and can really change the perception of breathing in your brain. So this costs about five dollars. It's um, battery operated, it's, there's no harm to it, and it can be very helpful. And lots of times people may use other bigger fans, or sometimes my patients say, I'll sit in a car with the air conditioning running, but the concept is to get the um, air movement close to your face. There's a variety of relaxation techniques to help reduce stress, as we've talked about this correlation between stress and anxiety and shortness of breath. Um, again, not one of these is perfect for, for everyone or all of them, but these have, um, some of these have been studied to be very helpful, um, a combination of sometimes people enjoy Tai Chi or meditation, listening to music, um, doing guided visualization or imagery, which we'll talk about some simple progressive muscle relaxation techniques. And I think the, the illustration on the bottom right is um, someone practicing yoga. So those are some resources for some the relaxation techniques. Guided imagery is very simple. You might um, just close your eyes and think about a peaceful place that you like to be. Maybe it's at the ocean or in the woods, some place that's calming. And while you're doing this, incorporating some of the breath techniques that we're going to teach you today or that you um, have been practicing. Sometimes it might be actually looking at a beautiful picture um, in your home or in your office that, you know, um, that brings you peace. But this is a simple technique that can, again, help with relaxation. Some people combine this with meditation or using a mantra, a word that might be helpful and calming to you. Um, and it can be anything that's important. Um, it could be breathe. It could be I am. Many people have tested different things, but this is a simple technique that can help you to focus on relaxing your breath. I'm going to show you um, soon a, an illustration of progressive muscle relaxation techniques that help to relax the, the body. Yoga has been demonstrated through several studies to help with shortness of breath for patients um, with lung diseases and can be helpful in terms of also strengthening um, your, your body with exercise and, and incorporates a lot of breath technique. And there's also been some studies that show that acupuncture and acupressure can help to temporarily decrease and manage shortness of breath. So there's some websites on there that I like to use for people that might be helpful if you're interested in learning a little bit more about these techniques. This is the demonstration of the progressive muscle relaxation. You really can sit or you can lie on a chair or lie on the, your bed or a sofa, wherever you're comfortable, and really just going through some of the major muscles in your body and intensing them and then relaxing them. So here's an example of scrunching up your face and then relaxing it, tensing up your arms and then relaxing, you know, tensing up your shoulders and chest and relaxing, and, and so on. The most important thing is when we sometimes tense our muscles, we hold our breath, and we don't want to do that. So make sure that while you're doing this, keep breathing in and out. Energy conservation um, is something that, again, may sound simple, but it's different once you're diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. And I think Beverly really sh shared that story with you, how she needed to then start to replan her day around her activity. She just couldn't get up and take, jump in the shower and go off to the park or go off to work anymore. She really needed to look at her day and plan and pace her activity so she had adequate energy. You know, prioritizing, this is hard for many of us to do, but it's okay and give yourself permission not to have to do everything on your to-do list um, for the day. It kind of takes the stress off um, of one and maybe it's more important to go and take a walk in the park than accomplish something else that to others might be important. 
and positioning. We talked about positioning earlier on, but even sitting when you're doing tasks, like if you're in the kitchen chopping vegetables for dinner or preparing dinner, dinner or using a shower seat to help bathe, can help to um, conserve some energy. I want to touch briefly on smoke and the tri um, environmental triggers. Um, not all lung cancers are caused by smoking, but many of them are. So if people um, are still continuing to smoke, we're here to help support the sensation. It's the best, healthiest thing you can do for your body to preserve your lung function. So I have a quit line that um, is on the slide, as well as there's many different types of nicotine replacement therapies for people to use. It's important to avoid secondhand smoke, um, avoiding extreme temperatures. Um, if it's very humid out, often people are more short of breath. Or if it's very cold out. I had a patient in clinic the other day and it said to me, it's so cold out I really couldn't go outside. I needed to use a scarf around my mouth to kind of rehumidify my breath. So it's important on those types of days where there might be poor air quality to um, stay indoors or try to avoid those, those triggers. And I'm just going to touch briefly and end with pulmonary rehab. This is a program that's um, established usually through hospitals or on outpatient um, basis. It's multidisciplinary, meaning that it's usually um, organized and run by nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, different people to, with expertise to help to devise an individual exercise program for people um, and include education, much as what you're learning today. It's been really um, helpful for people with lung cancer. And I know at least at Mayo Clinic, I have a colleague that he requires all of his patients to go through pulmonary rehab even prior to lung cancer. offered you know, usually about two to three sessions a week for 12 weeks, and it's reimbursed by most insurances and Medicare. And studies have demonstrated that it, it's very effective in helping people to improve their shortness of breath, their quality of life. It can help reduce the number of hospital days. And it can help with meeting other people. I know from my, from myself at least, when I have a, a date or an appointment, I'm much less, I'm much more likely to, to meet that um, obligation than to try to exercise on my own sometimes. And oh, you know, then I get lazy or something else comes up. So sometimes this is a nice setting to meet people that have um, the same or similar types of breathing problems, and you can learn and, and from one another and really help motivate one another to stick with it. And on that, I'm going to end with this slide. Again, I think one of my take homes is learning multiple approaches to manage your shortness of breath and you know, kind of figure out what works best for you that you can incorporate into your lifestyle. Thank you so much, Dr. Renke. That was really a lot of great information. Um, and now we're going to switch back to our uh, nine-year survivor, Beverly Goldsmith. And she's going to talk about what she found helpful to be useful in managing her medication, restlessness, and how working with Donna Wilson has improved her quality of life. After my second surgery, I was determined that no matter what happened, I would be able to resume my normal activities. I just had to learn how. As we could see from Dr. Renke's presentation, Help is available. You just have to know that and find it. As I was having shortness of breath upon activity, I shared my symptoms with my providers and we adjusted my medications as needed during the past seven years. When I am sick, I use my inhalers more. When I am exercising, as Dr. Renke suggested, I use another type of inhaler a half an hour before strenuous exercise. If it's cold outside, I use a different dosage and regime of my inhalers. I have fine-tuned my medications and dosages to live this life to the optimum. Learning how to breathe differently also changed my life. 
I learned to listen to my body and how to adapt to what it was telling me. I had to learn how to breathe using my diaphragm. The way I walked up steps, took long walks, went up hills had to change. I had to learn how to keep my voice when talking to a large group of people. And I had to manage other situations differently. I never realized the airflow that is needed to talk. But here is what I learned. I learned that if I am anxious or stressed, I'm not going to breathe correctly. And I have to be especially mindful to take a few minutes and adjust my breathing pattern. When walking up steps, I learned that I have to take one breath with each step. At first, walking long distances required rest stops. Walking up hills required stopping and doing my diaphragmatic breathing. I had to learn how to keep my voice intact while talking to a large group by giving myself time to breathe and take sips of water so that my vocal cords did not get dried out. Losing my voice was a problem that I had to learn to cope with and overcome. Maybe I just talk a lot, but that is one thing I would have found difficult to change. I learned that I could not multitask while I was walking in cold weather. I could not talk and walk at the same time. And I had to cover my mouth with a scarf. I also learned that I could not eat, talk, and walk at the same time, which is probably good advice for everyone. At the time of my recovery from the second surgery, we were renovating an apartment in New York City. I remember telling Donna, her next presenter, that when the workmen were around, I felt like I couldn't breathe comfortably. There was a tightness in my chest. Offering me good advice as usual, Donna told me to go into the bathroom, close the door, and just breathe. I did just that, and I felt much better. Most importantly, I learned that I had to keep going, even if I had an unsettling experience. If I was tired from walking one block, I had to continue and always take a few more steps. I did that, and now I could walk six miles, leaving some of my peers in the dust. And if the weather is reasonable, I can even talk, breathe, and eat while walking. While I like to sleep late, I have to that my friends tease me about. I am very active, stay up late, and could do strenuous aerobics, jog, weightlifting, can walk long distance, and when I want to, cook dinner for eight. I volunteer for a number of causes and take courses at our synagogue and music lessons at the 92nd Street Y three or four times a week. I take long walks, sometimes six miles, on the beach in the Outer Banks. Last year, we were able to enjoy a very active vacation. We traveled to Morocco with a group of friends and rode camels into the Sahara Desert. I did this, as the Beatles say, with a little help from my friends. The bottom line is that even with lung cancer, I have more stamina than most others my age. My lung capacity is normal. I still need to be aware of my limitations, avoid getting sick, get my flu shot, stay out of extreme cold weather, continue my training sessions, my medical checkups, and make a point of eating, sleeping, and exercising in a healthy way. But I am living a full, productive life. When I look back at my own recovery, I realize that I have learned how to compensate for not having a right lung. My body and my mind have adjusted and adapted to the change. This was done step by step, doing my usual activities, analyzing what was wrong, and then talking and working with my treatment team, 
Donna, my internist, my pulmonologist, my sinus doctor. And of course, always reaching out as needed to my supportive family and friends. I'm thankful for my husband for his support and for making breakfast and letting me sleep late. I am also especially thankful to our next presenter, Donna Wilson, for teaching me how to breathe. I see Donna every week, and her consistent input, coaching, and more than occasional nudging is what helped me push myself to the next step and to not give up until I reach my goals. I am grateful for her pushing me so hard. Donna will help you understand how to breathe and share with you valuable techniques you could all use. Hello, everyone. I'm Donna Wilson. Um, and yes, breathing is near and dear to my heart. The first thing I really want to say to you is that think about breathing as medicine. Just think about that. And we're going to talk about that at the end as well. Exercise is medicine. Most importantly, when people become short of breath, they'll ask me why, why, why. But think about it. You breathe. How, why do you breathe? How do you breathe? You breathe because of the muscles of your chest wall. So we know that we have to keep those muscles in really good shape. Otherwise, as they get weaker, then our breath, the depth of respiration gets less, and we start breathing faster and more inefficiently. So you want to improve everything, and in, in that, essentially, we're talking about the muscles of the chest wall and the diaphragm. But the diaphragm is truly, it's a, it goes from the back all the way under the ribs. If you put your fingertips down at the bottom of your ribs and just did a sniff, you would feel that big diaphragm there. It's a very large muscle. It's probably responsible for about 60% of your effort of breathing in. So keeping that muscle as strong is most important. And really exercising does make the difference. So what are the causes of breathlessness? So think about it. If we become sick or we have you know, major weight loss we, or we lose a lot of muscular strength, that's going to make a difference in how we breathe. Um, it may change your breathing pattern that you're using the upper chest more, efficient, more inefficiently than the lower. Um, you might have cardiovascular problems, and then just in general, you might get exhausted really easy, or you might have, you don't sleep well, and then you have anxiety, and then with anxiety, your heart rate goes up, so you increase your level of breathlessness, and of course, panic attacks are common. So I look at breathing as the perfect exchange. Um, you breathe in oxygen to nourish everything in the body, um, and you need oxygen for every muscle contraction in your body. And then after that oxygen goes into the tissues, carbon dioxide comes out, and it comes up through the lungs, and you breathe carbon dioxide out. So you get rid of all the toxins and the carbon dioxide that's in your body. So you're breathing is using all the muscles again, you know, and that is you breathe in, and as you breathe in, now I feel when you're doing a breathing exercise, um, you want to breathe in through your nose because if you breathe in through your nose, you'll feel the diaphragm and the diaphragm flexes downward and then the lungs are filling up with air. Then when you breathe out, you, the diaphragm will rise, go upward, and the air is helped push out of the lung. So it really makes a difference that you understand the whole process. So improving that level of breathlessness, again, is keeping everything strong or breathing out. Now, I also feel very strong that the power of your breath, the power, you will always breathe in. Remember that. You will always breathe in unless you had a neurologic injury, a brain injury, that you couldn't breathe in. But you'll always breathe in. But people don't breathe out efficiently enough. They don't have a good mental count of breathing out and getting all the air out so they can get a better breath and oxygen in. And sometimes that's difficult because of the different disease you're going through. So you have to use perspirate breathing. But you want to really coordinate your exercise and your, your pattern of breathing. So it's most important that we coordinate it. So as you see in the, you know, when I coordinate the movement with breathing is that if you're lifting weights, 
when you lift a weight or you push a weight or you pull something or exerting energy like bending over to tie your shoes, you should always be breathing out. Also breathing out through pursed lips as we saw early with Dr. Renke, you create a little back pressure in your cheeks. And that back pressure in your cheeks prevents your small airways from closing. So it's very important to utilize the pursed lip breathing as you're lifting a weight. And always then, you breathe in when you lower the weight. Never, 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 I can never say it enough, never hold your breath. And that's most, most important. So I'm going to go over a few little breathing exercises here. And one, I like this breath. Because it's a great relaxation breath, you can, you know, utilize it before you're going to bed or if you feel like you're having an anxiety t time or you just have to sit quietly. And it's, you, you, I call it the 488. I think about breathing in through your nose for the count of four, holding the breath. Now, this is not bearing down. This is just holding the breath um, for the count of eight and then breathing out through purse lips. I love you to say, breathe as long as you can, but at least breathe out for a count of eight. It doesn't always mean eight seconds. It's your count of eight. So your count of eight might be much longer than mine. But either way, get all that air out. Get rid of all that carbon dioxide and toxins, and then you can take a better breath in. So that commonly I'll tell people to do that four breaths in a row, very calmly and very slow. And you might want to practice two or three times a day, just so you're comfortable. You could be sitting in the car, you could be right before you go to bed, it could be any time of the day. Next. Now, why is pursed lips, as we just really talked about, but you can, it, but when you have pursed lips, you're using it with an activity. So like if you're stretching your arms behind your back and you're, you're breathing out, if you do pursed lips, you get a longer length of time breathing out. And sometimes just having a mental count in your head, counting, you know, a mental count of six to eight or six to ten, whatever you can do, but always lengthening that time. So I have a, um, an exercise here that I used to call the aerobic diaphragmatic breathing exercise, but um, my lung patients say, well, why don't you just call it what it is? And it's fast breathing to strengthen the diaphragm, but it's called sniffles. Now, again, I mentioned it earlier, but think now. If you can put your hand under the bottom of your ribs, just get right at the bottom, and just do a couple of sniffs, sniff, sniff, sniff in, like you're sniffing a flower, that's your diaphragm. So how are we going to strengthen that? Well, I developed this exercise years ago, and I have to say people are always surprised when um, so many of my lung patients are not short of breath because their diaphragms are in such good strengthening power. You sit comfortably with your back up and you place your, you're very comfortable with your hands and your feet and you close your mouth and you breathe quickly in and out of your nose. So it's a breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. Now, if you feel like the count is irregular, like breathe in but breathe out, but it's irregular, stop. Just relax for a minute a second, and then start again. So it's breathe in one, two, breathe out one, two, breathe in. So it's, if, if you hear me on the phone, I could, I could exhibit it. This is what it would sound like. So it's a really quick breath. You start off slow, and your goal is, is that you could maybe go up to 60 seconds, one to two times a day. And that will be like an aerobic strengthening exercise for the diaphragm. Um, another breath that is helpful, um, and it's helpful with a couple of aspects. If you're exercising or you are going up a flight of stairs that you didn't expect or you have, go into a vigorous coughing episode or you're just having a really panic attack or an anxiety or you just can't control your breath. Your oxygen is on, you just can't control it. This is what I um, have developed with people. is I have them sit down and then I have them put their chin to their chest. That what, when you put your chin down to your chest, what happens is you relax all the neck muscles. And when you re relax the neck muscles, then we can just work on the diaphragm. And then I just have you breathe out through pursed lips quickly. So just breathe out, through, just quick bursts, 10 times. And then when you feel that anxiety and the tightness going away from your throat, you breathe in through your nose and you breathe out through um, your mouth for a count of four. 
Then when you feel like, wow, I'm really feeling back to normal, I really want to get that heart rate down and I want to open the airways, it's what you do is you breathe in through your nose and you open your mouth and you just make the vocal sound, ah, like a big sigh. Now, over the years of working with lung patients and doing bronchoscopies, I've actually done this breath with patients. And what happens is when I do that breath with patients, I can actually see the vocal cords open and close when I would do a bronchoscopy. So what would happen is that it would, um, it would, uh, you could see that, that it would decrease the amount of volume out. So therefore, everything goes down. Um, and you know, I have videos online. You surely can go to the videos online and just try to do it. And just you know, you you can just put put your arms up and you do a shoulder press. You breathe out and bring your elbows forward. You breathe in and open that chest. You breathe out as you go forward. You breathe in as you open that chest. And you know, you repeat these exercises. You want to really contract the muscles of the back so they're squeezing into your spine and strengthening the back muscles because you use them as well. And then forward as you breathe in. You do all these kinds of exercises for approximately um, 10, you know, 8 to 10 repetitions. And that would be just terrific just to keep everything really strong and mobile. Um, the next thing I'd like to just talk about is um, um, we want to talk about what what happens when you are um, exercising. So people say, well, I started exercising. I got really short of breath. I didn't know what to do. It's every muscle contraction that you take in your body takes oxygen. So as you need more oxygen for every muscle contraction, there's a whole lot of enzyme process going into your body. And what happens is that as you do that, you have to breathe faster. So it's normal to feel breathing faster. And think about you know, how bad it feels. If you're unable to speak, then you stop the exercise and wait till you can catch your breath. So really, it's most important not to get nervous, but just to think, how long did it take me to then that's perfect. Then go back and resume your exercise or kind of modify it a little bit. But always remember, breathing out is the key. So I really feel very strong. The power is in the exhale. The power is breathing out. So when I, I've said it before, and I'll say it again, so it just can be an imprint in your brain, is that when you're doing something, you're bending over the most common complaint. You know, you could have just had your, your meal, your tummy's full of food, so you know, everything's using a little bit more oxygen to break down that food. Then you bend over to put your shoes on, and you wake up, and you come up, and you're dizzy. Even though your tummy's full, make sure you bend over, breathe out, as you tie your shoe. And make sure that when you're getting out of a chair, it's, you know, you breathe out. Or when you're walking or walking up a hill. The stair climbing, as Beverly said, is what I teach, is that when you go up each step, when you go up one step, your whole body is on that one leg. And that's a lot of work. So breathe out and get up so that you, if you utilize a breathing out method of each step, before you know it, you'll be able to go up one breath every two steps. But it really makes it work. And it's a good, stair climbing is actually a very good cardiovascular exercise. And always with your arms, when you lift, when you're lifting your arms up, breathe out. So I think that, you know, most important, if I can um, just say the, the few things that I really feel strong is that breathing is the power that you have and to lengthen that time that you breathe out. And also, be consistent. Do the breathing exercises consistently. Don't just wait and do them in, when you're having a difficult time. Try to work them into your whole lifestyle, as Beverly has done. Um, and yes, I have to remind her sometimes when um, you know she's doing something that she didn't remember. But you know what? That's what I'm here for, and that's what you want to do. I'm on YouTube, and it talks about all these aspects of breathing and coordinating exercise with breathing. So please use them. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions. And thanks so much. But remember, exercise is a medicine. Thank you very much.
Wow. Well, thank you uh, so much to both Beverly and Donna for your tips, and, and especially Donna for those invigorating techniques. I always feel like we all get a, a workout whenever you, whenever you talk. Um, so this ends the presentation portion of the webinar, and we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. There is a, a question section on your screen. Um, please continue to ask questions. We do have a few that we um, will answer. If we don't get to all of the questions, just know that we will be contacting you individually. And if you think of uh, questions after the webinar, you can sure just email me directly at that email address on your screen. So um, this one's for Dr. Uh, Reinke. Um, we really learned a lot of tips today. Uh, if you had to pick one that everyone could try right now without even having to talk with their treatment team, what would it be? Thanks for the question. My response is pursed lip breathing. It's easy to learn, it works quickly, and you can take it anywhere. Perfect. Um, and Donna, um, if somebody doesn't have access to someone like you at, the, at their cancer center, uh, where would you suggest they go for help? Well, I think you can go to, um, as uh, Dr. Reinke said, most of the institutions have pulmonary rehab, or you have some really good respiratory therapy programs, and they can provide um, some help with you. So, it, and every hospital has a respiratory therapy program, and almost every hospital has some, sometimes physical therapists will be doing breathing, and sometimes respiratory therapy, but either way, um, that, that would be something that is easy access. Okay, great. And, and I just would like to add, too, that the COPD, COPD Foundation, and that's at copdfoundation.org, they do have a searchable list of pulmonary rehab uh, centers on their website. Okay. Um, and Beverly, uh, how long did you work with Donna before you noticed a difference in your breathing? Um, I, I think I, I started noticing a difference, I mean, immediate, immediately, but small, you know, uh, you know, a minor difference. But I, because Donna incorporated the breathing with exercises, and I just felt myself getting stronger. Um, so that's a hard question to answer. I don't know, Donna, when do you think I... Well, I, I mean, initially she did a lot of breath holding because with her discipline, she used a splint, meaning that she would take the incision. So one of the things we had to do is sort of mobilize her chest wall a little bit so she had more flexibility. So one of the things that people can do is doing mobilization stretching, kind of nice easy movements if you, and, and especially the side when you have surgery, is to put your arm over your head, but always breathing out when the arm goes over the head so you can do the stretching. And I think once she started to understand that, then doing her, her other activities of daily living, and it goes back to breathing out when you push, pull, lift, or bend over. Yeah, and I think the bottom line is it was a process. Like it doesn't happen overnight because I was mm -hmm. on pain medicine when I started seeing Donna and I was depressed thinking I was never going to be able to live my life again and like all these other things. And then as I slowly got better and slowly adjusted my medications and got off the pain medicine <clears throat> and got stronger, you know, I, I felt better. But I, I felt change immediately in monitoring whether I could walk a block or a block and a half or two blocks or whatever. So in yeah. setting reasonable goals, I could see that I met those goals and moved on. Okay. That's really helpful. Uh, thanks so much. Okay, so, so through today's webinar, we hope that you have learned a variety of ways that uh, can help you breathe easier during and after lung cancer treatment. If you're struggling with shortness of breath, please talk with your treatment team about your options and before starting any exercise. We thank Dr. Reinke and Donna Wilson for all we've learned today and for their dedication to improving the lives of people with lung cancer and other respiratory dis disorders. And thank you to Beverly Goldsmith for sharing her story and valuable tips for maintaining an active lifestyle. We'd also like to recognize our program supporters, Helson and Tesaro, 
Without their support, the series would not have been possible. Thank you. And a special thanks to all of you who joined us today. We'll post this and the other coping series videos to the LCA YouTube channel. Please contact us with any questions about breathlessness or anything else lung cancer related for a copy of the tip sheet. And do check out Donna's videos on YouTube and Beverly Survivor Spotlight on the LCA Facebook page. And please join us for the next installment of our coping series, Managing GI Toxicities. That will be coming in April, and we'll have uh, more details soon. So thank you all. <laughs>